Yay. All right, I'm going to blitz through this one. So I'm going to talk ab about Hoon, and we'll talk about how Hoon fits in with the usual programming paradigms and how it's different, and we'll talk about trade-offs and stuff. So Hoon is to Urbit as C is to Unix, so we need to talk about what Urbit is, and we already did that. It's a complete clean slate software stack with OS and networking and all kinds of good stuff. And it has revisited every assumption about how computers ought to work. Um, often they converge on the same decisions that everyone's been making for the last 70 years, but sometimes they do different things, like Kelvin versioning. So some things like um, Hoon and Knock, which we'll be talking about later, the versions decrease and they have a Kelvin number to them. So why do they do this? And the answer is, usually with software, you can think of improvement as sort of an additive process. So you have version 2, which does cool stuff that version 1 didn't do, and then we'll have version 2.1, which fixes all the stuff in 2.0 that didn't work. And then we'll have version 3, which will probably be different, and maybe it'll be better, but probably not. And this is sensible because you launch software in a state of uncertainty and you start to revisit your assumptions and test things out. Users figure out what they're doing and then you have technology changes and then sometimes you just get a decision straight for marketing. I don't know, does this look like some marketing would come up with? <laughs> Certainly my marketing. But why do we assume that progress means something has to change? Um, like JSON, which is for packaging data between clients and servers, and hasn't changed barely at all since it came out. And I can really think that if my great-grandchildren get into doing software, they will probably be using the very same JSON that I'm using right now. Because they just pretty much got it right. I might do things differently, like I might add some commas, like as an optional if you want to do an array. But other than that, you have a lot of convenience for having this part of your code that never changes. So when they do Cloud Tron version 5, then whatever else they're going to have to do, they will probably not have to worry about a new version of JSON. That will be done, and you can just ignore it. And this is just the problem with formatting data. So imagine if the language, the libraries, the network stack, and the OS aren't changing. And you never have dependency hell because everything you're working with is effectively done, except for this app you just had an idea for. So that is what they're going for with, um, with Knock and Hoon and other parts of Arbit is freezing it. So we think of an ideal solution as something that stops changing. You define a scope and as something that you can do, and then progress means these are the things that we don't have to change anymore. So this is Kelvin versioning. You have this platonic ideal solution that's version 0k, and then every version you get is getting closer to it. So to make something that you can freeze, you want it to be simple, and you need to be ruthlessly simple so that you make all your choices about what is in scope and isn't in scope, and if it's not in scope, you do as little as possible with it. And by doing so, you have the most options available to you when you actually do something with it. This is, in my opinion, a solution to the law of leaky abstractions, that if there's no functionality to abstract away, there's nothing to leak. So really, complexity in any system is kind of it's an additive thing. You can make something simple from something else that's simple. But if you have something complex already, you can't build, you can't build anything simple from it. The best you can do is move the complexity to from one group of users to the other one so you have this really nice front end and a nightmarish back end or vice versa. So in Urbit, the simplest basis for a computing system is NOC. This is functional assembly language. And as Ted can demonstrate, it is small enough to fit on a t-shirt. The data model reads, he, he does so. 
A noun is an atom or a cell. An atom is any natural number and a cell is an ordered pair of nouns. Basically, a noun is a binary tree whose leaves are numbers, specifically unsigned integers of an arbitrary length. Somebody called them S expressions without the S because Nock has no interest in what the atom is. Uh, the next line notes that Nock is a function, which it's functional assembly language, so I should hope so. Uh, we have instructions for comparing two values, determining if it's a noun or if a noun is a cell or just an atom. We um, have addressing for binary trees and making a constant. And knock is, I call it homo iconic. It doesn't really have a syntax. It's all, it is but it is, so you need an apply function to figure out if this is, if this is code or data. And there is one count up math instruction, which is increment. And as anyone who's read the little schemer, have you all read that? Okay, yes, you can make all arithmetic from increment. It will be slow as hell, but you know, like when you start doing matrix arithmetic, but it is possible. And this is, uh, this is how you do decrement. I know, right? I was just at the APL thing. I really would rather just look at that. Um, so since we only have one math operation, it's explicitly taking speed and performance entirely out of scope. You're going to have to solve that at some point, but we're just saying we're not going to solve it right now. Um, instructions 6 through 12 are macros. We've got function composition, if then else, editing a noun, and some other somewhat esoteric odds and ends that I don't want to get into, and hints, which I really don't want to get into. And that's it. So this is like building math from increment. You can build all of computing just from these operations. Uh, there's some overlap with lambda calculus, but as everyone will point out, this is not based on lambda calculus because the guy who wrote this doesn't actually know lambda calculus. So, um, so there's some trade-offs in knock. It is not the simplest basis for computing that's theoretically possible, but um, like it wouldn't have macros, but it's the simplest that can actually be useful. So, you know, if we have, we know we're going to have to do if then else, so we make a macro for it because then we can know at a glance this is what we're looking at rather than having to infer this by looking at a bunch of nested apply statements. Uh, we only have one primitive data type, which is the unsigned integer, so, but also we're going to handle that somewhere else. The only data structure we have is a binary tree, which is not, I don't think it's the simplest one they could have picked, like a brain fuck uses a um, an arbitrary length array, that's probably simpler. But uh, this is the simplest one. It's a good trade-off between simplicity and utility. You can do a lot with it. Also missing variables, functions, an environment, a syntax, and any kind of error handling. If you screw up something, it crashes. So this is the other reason it's not derived from lambda calculus because it doesn't have variables. Okay, so now that we have that background, we can look at Hoon quickly. So Hoon is higher level language that compiles down to the aforementioned NOC. It's intended to be a systems language, so it's good at compiling and running and reloading programs at runtime. It can hot reload an app, kernel module, or the whole OS just by running a function on an incoming packet. The compiler for Hoon is written in Hoon, and don't ask me how this is possible. Um, it also uses Kelvin versioning. Its version is 143, and Knock is on version 4, so it's got a ways to go. But it is intended to be frozen. So it is also striving for simplicity between its relationship to Knock and what the compiler is doing and its semantics. So um, Hoon programs are composed of Hoons which are abstract syntax trees. So each expression begins with a rune, which is a pair of ASCII characters, which are followed by one or more sub-expressions, which may, not, may or may not be, but usually are hoons. So given the ASCII heavy nature, we have a set of nicknames for each ASCII character. It is not entirely necessary to memorize this, but it will make it more likely your dreams come true. So I encourage everyone to do that. Um, 
So using these runes, as, as Ted pointed out this morning, you can make code that you can read out loud, which is interesting. Um, and I'll probably end up using most of these throughout the presentation, so sorry about that. So here is my favorite introduction to functional programming, the Fibonacci generator, which takes an N and prints the first N numbers in the Fibonacci sequence, which I'll run through quickly. We form a gate with this rune, which is more or less equivalent to a function. Um, we define a couple of variables. Uh, this sets a recursion point, more or less. This is the this is going to cast the return value for the recursive function to unsigned decimal, a list of unsigned decimals. Uh, on line six, this rune is cons, so we're making a cell, and A is the head, and this is if, then, else, so if our n is zero, then we append null to it, which is the tilde, or sig. And then otherwise we recurse with updating val by updating values. So we decrement n, we set a to b, and then b becomes a plus b. Actually, so the director's cut of what's going on here is that we are making an anonymous function called buck or dollar sign, um, and its contents are the rest of this program, and it gets called immediately. And then on line 10, we're basically, we call the same function we just created again with some changes. And, oh look, it's a demo. So, are we demoing? No, we're not demoing. Okay, now where are we demoing? Ah, hmm. oh, curses. Oh, hey, check that out. You guys get that and I don't. This is great. Okay, so that was our source and then you run it with the first 10 numbers, and hopefully that's the right answer. All right, great. So um, each of the runes has expected sub-expressions. So we don't have our Lisp style in closing parentheses. Um, and so we don't have our little pile of 17 closing parentheses that finish off every file. But the trade-off is that you have to know your sub-expressions, and you have to know kind of where one hoon begins and the other one ends. Um, usually you can clarify things if you use good style and the preferred kind of indentation. So as an example, um, you create a cell with colhep. Um, this is formally defined as colhep with p is a hoon and then q is a hoon. These are the arguments. So. Usually, as in this case, um, you can just make a cell with two values. Or, as we saw in our Fibonacci, you make a cell where one of the values is A, and then the other value is the result of the if-then-else statement. So, some of them look differently, like, um, what is this, tisfas equal then forward slash. Um, we saw that in our Fibonacci to declare a variable. It's defined as tisfas, toro, hoon, and hoon. So toro is basically a label with an optional type, like A there. Um, oh wait. Uh, and then the Q is our value, which we're setting A to zero. And then R, in this case, is the rest of the program. So a lot of runes end up working like that, like if you want to uh, cast a value or restrict the Hoon version, um, then you can write code that reads like a sequence of actions. And I kind of, that's how my brain works. I did a lot of turtle programming in grade school. Um, 
you know, like making the turtle go this way and go in circles and stuff. And that's, that's just how I think. And you can write code that sort of flows this way um, so that your meat just kind of flows down. Um, so like if you have an if statement and most of the interesting stuff happens in true, then you can use the rune for if not. And then kind of the not is the exception thing and then everything else flows down from that. Um, this is style. And I think of style as like soft syntax. It's like syntax that you don't have to formalize to the point that something as stupid as a compiler can understand it. And you don't have to push out a new change. You can just, the developer community has decided we're going to do it this way. So in Hoon, everything is operated against one operand, the subject. And it returns one result, which is the product. And there's no environment or scope. And there's no symbol table. There is only the subject. The subject, by default, contains standard libraries and info about the machine we're running. So, I mean, it doesn't have an environment or scope, but it kind of does. It's just, you can also restrict the subject to be a limited subset of just what you want to work with. Um, a brief digression on language trade-offs. So, I described the syntax for Hoon as terrifying, and I, I think that's true. I think most people who kind of dig into it would agree with it. Although after I saw the presentation on APL, um, I have a new appreciation for how terrifying syntax could be. So syntax I'm using to mean like what, what do you have to type out to do the thing that you're trying to do? You know, how complicated is it? And this is different than semantics, which means what are the things you're typing out mean? You know, how easily can you fit all of this into your head? Or another way to look at it is that syntax is the front end or the thing the developer is using. And then semantics is the back end, which is what the machine and compiler are thinking about. So in any language, I feel there is a tension between syntax and semantics. I mean, you can have a really bad language that has bad syntax and bad semantics. But at some point, simplifying one is going to come at the expense of the other one. As an example, like dynamic types. Um, make for easier syntax. Like in JavaScript, you can set thing equal to 23 and then thing equal to a string and then thing equal to a float. And it doesn't care. The problem is, at any given point in time, what, what is thing? Like, what's values in there? And if you want to append a string to it, what's going to happen? Um, what's that going to look like? And I'm picking on JavaScript because it's kind of a semantic dumpster fire, but, um, and it'll accept pretty much anything. But um, in contrast, there's knock, which is really simple. It has simple syntax and simple semantics. It's just that it's by itself, it can't really do a lot. Um, like, it has no types. And I don't think you're going to get a lot done without any kind of type system at all. So the third point is expressiveness. Like, what concepts does the language make possible? Or how easy is it to put them in code? Like, you can write, I don't know, you can write a Fortran compiler in BrainFuck if you want to, if that's what you want to do with your weekend. But, you know, it's not, it's not easy. It doesn't make that possible in a short amount of time. So here's my diagram. Um, this is also the most important slide here. This is uh, LeBlanc's triangle. <laughs> So the idea is this kind of like the pick any two. So you can have simple syntax, simple semantics, or something highly expressive, but you can't have all three of them. Um, Hoon's, um, oh, by the way, this isn't an original idea, like at all, but um, I did make it into a triangle shape and named it after myself. So that part's original. <laughs> um, so Hoon has, I feel, really simple semantics and it chooses the semantics in a way that you can express a lot with it. It's just, you kind of have clunky syntax. So, it would be great to talk about all the ins and outs, but they only gave me 50 minutes. So, we'll talk about types because, I don't know, it's functional programming. You guys love that stuff. I love this stuff too. You've got the shirt and everything, so. Um, so, what is a type? really. It's a set of values that conforms to some kind of semantic criteria. You could have infinitely many values. You could have zero many values or maybe one value. Um, 
conveniently, this is also the really close to what a function is, which takes some input domain and does stuff, and the output is some other domain, or the range. So all functional languages work like that, and Huon is a functional language. So for a minimalist type system, all you really need is the humble function, which could take as a domain any value and validate that it conforms to whatever your criteria is. And if it does, you pass it along. And if it doesn't, you could give it some default value that's still part of your type domain. And not at all coincidentally, that's how mold works, which is the Hoon type constructor. So um, we talked about this. It's Hoon's designed as a thin layer over knock, and it still uses nouns internally to represent everything. Um, which makes kind of the type constructor as a function thing work quite a bit easier because everything you're going to have is ultimately going to be numbers and trees. Uh, but it adds some stuff to make everyone's life easier. Um, so we were going to talk about what we're going to do with unsigned integers in the future, and the future is now. So if it's an unsigned integer, basically it's a collection of bytes. And anything that can be represented as bytes could be an atom, like signed integers, unsigned integers, Floats, strings, your Bitcoin wallet address, animated GIFs, genome of the naked mole rat, crack copy of Duke Nukem 2. Um, so if you know what the atom represents, you can give it a soft type or an aura. And these are actually all auras, including the Bitcoin wallet, but not the last three. Those were silly. So aura specialized to the right. Um, at is any atom. Or, excuse me, pat. Uh, Pat T is text or a chord. Pat T A is ASCII text, and Pat T A S is ASCII text restricted to lowercase or digits or hyphens. And this is kind of Pat as the generic atom is similar in this instance to kind of how any works in Scala. Actually, it's tar. It's really neat. Uh, so tar is an asterisk. Yeah. And that, that means any noun. Any noun, right? Yeah. This is any atom. So there's also uh, cat, which is any pair, any subject. Yes, what do you said? Mm-hmm. Built in mold. Yeah. Functions that normalize distance. So here are an assortment of atoms. Um, underneath it all, there's still all the very large integers. Um, the syntax for these is kind of weird, especially like um, sign decimals. As you can see, negative is negative, and then two negatives is positive um, because the plus sign is not URL safe. At some point, they made a decision to make all of these be URL safe, and I don't know if they want to do over on that, um, but <laughs> that's kind of what they're stuck with. But the advantage that you get from this is that um, every the, these all have unique parsing rules. so. Which gives you two things. Number one, the parser can do everything for you, so you don't have to compile it before you figure out what the, you know, what the aura is. And also, you can just kind of look at it yourself and tell what it is, so you don't have to, you don't have to wait to see what gets inferred. You can also claim it on the right. And you can do that. Yes, we'll do that in a second. We just never see. You see dates sometimes. You see like urban addresses. And you see like unsigned, various unsigned numbers, like decimal and hex. And that's about it. You very rarely see any of the other ones. Either. Yeah. Turns out you don't use very many floating point numbers in your implementing operating system. Doesn't mean you won't, just they haven't gotten to that point it's yet. It's non-preemptive OS, too, so they're not doing much scheduling. Mm, OK. So yeah. The interesting one here is the pad P, which is the phonemic base. So tilde LEB, which I mentioned, that's the, uh, that's the galaxy I lucked my way into owning, is 145. Sam toll is 1066. And, okay, demo. Okay, so let's see. So we're adding 70 to 4 for reasons I will get into. And then this what, if you do the question mark, you can figure out, well, what, what is the type of this thing? In this case, it is a generic atom. 
So cat have this is our cast. So we're going to try and cast the result of that function to t, which is text, and we get j. That's a good letter. And then we can take j and try and turn it into a generic atom, and that works fine. Is the generic atom type roughly equivalent to like a void star, non-Martian system? Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of. The void pointer is kind of more like a noun, I would yeah. say, just like any noun. Okay. Is, uh, I mean, with with a void pointer, you just have no type information at all. Right. right. And so. If you have no type of information at all, that's just tar, asterisk, just noun, just any binary yeah. tree, which could be an atom or it could be a cell, um, and the cell could be of other things, right? It's, it's a recursive type. Right. Um, but yeah, and actually we do use that quite a bit in Hoon because one of the things that Hoon needs to do is uh, like reload itself with the new version of Hoon. Right. Right, and so like if you take in uh, and in that case, like you might have state lying around that was of a type that you don't understand anymore. Okay. Uh, and so, like, you don't. There are just times when you lose the type information, and then we have to be, have ways of coercing untyped data into type data, so that we can start using it. Okay. So, uh, like, pattern so like a char star. Uh, mm -hmm. That is. It's something that, that you like might a, send over a TCP it's like socket. A, it's a, yeah. it's a big number, basically. It's okay. a, so it's either a big uh -huh. num or a, or you can think of it as a byte stream. Okay. Uh, like we use it to, as as big nums or small nums, and we also use it as byte stream. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. I think byte stream is probably. Byte stream is probably the closest. Yeah. So we're going to try to cast seventy four directly to text. And oh, we get nest fail. So this means that our type checker didn't like it. And then in this case, we can figure out what do you think 74 is? And it thinks it's an unsigned decimal, which it is. So since that's a, I guess a at u um, aura, you can't go from at u to at t directly. You have to go straight to generic atom, and then you can go back down. And conveniently, but confusingly, um, these uh, back ticks is a way to do that. It will do that cast for you. We might actually rip that out. It's a little too clever. Is that just like find any available path to cast? No, what it actually does is it casts it. It adds another cast in between. Right. So it, it really it expands out as a, like it's a macro expansion in the compiler and expands out to cast to pat t of cast just to pat mm -hmm. plus 74. Because yeah. you can always cast any atom to just plain atom, and you can cast plain atom to any other aura. So it's going to go up and back down. Right. Right now this is a shortcut that takes you up and back down, but it's it's actually the only rune. So like it's the same thing as the cat hat. It's just like inline syntax. And then it's two syntaxes as like white the flat form where everything's separated by spaces and then like inline form, uh, just called flat form. And that's uh, like usually just one space separating the arguments with the parentheses around things. And there are some irregular forms of runes. So the kethap rune has an irregular form of the backticks. It's the same thing, but this is actually the only case where the inline form is like has different semantics from the from the normal form. Uh, so because it, we, it just sucks, like we yeah. didn't have that except. Gotcha. This is one of those examples where like you know. The, the syntax is great, um, it's really convenient, and I used it here in the demo because it's easy. But yeah, it's like adding another step in your brain that, or that you just have to remember is going on. So this is our phonemic base. Um, so all the urbit identities have the same size as an IP address, so you can kind of compare what those are. This is what local host would be. Or we can, so this ship here, like what would this be as an IP address? Uh, I have this for IP address. Personally, I think the uh, Mallet Rolmo is a little bit more memorable than the other one, but I don't know, your opinion may vary on that, so. And that's that bit of demo.
Okay, trees. Man, where'd all the time go? Oh, that's right, we had to move room six times. Um, so in knock, everything is an address or a slot. So uh, one is the tree itself, and then for any other value, like 14, you would, if you want the left of seven, it's 14, and then the right of seven would be um, two times seven plus one or 15. Uh, with Hoon, we get faces. Um, so basically you can do a label on each of the nodes and then to access it, it will do a depth first search. So um, there's no symbol table in Hoon. So if you want to dig something out of one of your, one of your uh, nouns or your data structures, you have to do a search, which is more simple semantically. We have union types. Um, the search happens at compile. Yes. Okay. Um, so they have kind of the either type, only better, because you don't have to do left or right. You can do an arbitrary number of alternative types. Actually, Haskell supports that too. Um, and it has sort of this type where if you have an atom, you default to this type. And if you have a a cell, then you default to another type. Um, in this case, a unit is one of these, which is their version of maybe, or option, or possibly, which I made up. Um, it has two possible values, which is either um, the null value, or nothing, or none, and then it has a cell of null and A, which is just A, or some A. And in the standard library, they have bind, and just, which I believe Haskell calls return. So type checking is called nesting, where basically you have a set of values, and then the type check is does, so your, your type is a set of values, and then you have another type, and you say, does this type's set of possible values fit within the other set of values? So is it a subset? Um, so if you want to check if uh, null will nest against unit, um, then basically it will say, well, null is, or unit is either null or a cell, so yes, that nests within unit. Um, and if it doesn't work, you get a nest fail because that means that it doesn't nest, it's not a subtype. So, more demo. Hopefully this will go quickly, because I'm really running out of time. Yeah, we got to do this. So, we're going to make a, a type that's a dog, which is kind of our, um, we're using our types as sort of an associative array here, which it makes easy to do because that's kind of, basically we're just attaching faces to nodes and then giving them types and then that becomes what our type is. So there's a dog, this is Bruno, this is my dog. So we give Bruno a name. And we give him a color. I call him kind of a fawn color. And a date of birth. <laughs> so we can ask what type Bruno is, and he is that associative array tuple type. And then if you do two question marks or what what on Bruno, this is kind of the the uncensored type. So internally we see that um, the type for Bruno is basically a cell and then the faces are sort of labels there. It's basically, this is all noun stuff and with just um, I guess labels just to uh, for the compiler's sake. Yeah, the labels live in the type, and the types get stripped out at compile time. Uh, well, they're, they're, se they're separated, basically. They're not used for evaluation, but they are used for type checking. And then you can, depending on how it gets compiled, often you can use them for inspection, runtime reflection, which is what we're doing here. Yeah, so, uh, and this kind of gives us our internal types, so. Moon is a statically typed language. And it's compiled, but 
frequently what you're doing in Hoon is you're, you're like using the compiler as a library and compiling other Hoon. And so there's this weird thing where it's, it's statically typed, but it's dynamically compiled. And so you can do sort of things that are like dynamic types by compiling stuff. So we do our typecast just to make sure that Bruno is a dog. Bruno is a dog. I can vouch for that. So we're going to make a bad dog. So this is Rex. He's hairless. And he has a bad date of birth. So let's try to cast Rex as a dog. And Rex is a bad dog. Missed fail. That's no good. So, um, what's going on? Oh, yeah, so I mentioned um, a mold is a function. And so you can, if you want to, call the function directly. So let's say you have like a web service, or not a web, like a service, an Urbit service that accepts a dog as uh, one of its input types. So you can call the mold directly to verify that you have a dog. So we'll do that with Bruno. And then, yes, Bruno is still a dog, so it just passes Bruno through. Um, the aura for color changed slightly, but otherwise it's the same. So if somebody sends some malform packet, it will still make a dog. It's just that's the default values for all the, uh, the auras for that. And then Rex, it was able to figure out what to do with 42. So basically it cast 42 into um, an absolute date. And then we can do type verification by pattern matching with what tis. So we can say, does Bruno's type have a color, which is some atom and something else? And the answer is yes. Or we can say, does Bruno's type have a color and then three other atoms? And the answer is, well, what is the answer? It's no, because he only has two other atoms. So. Yeah, and note that uh, so the, here we're seeing the mold, mold dog being used as a normalizer, right? So we passed in something that wasn't a valid dog, and what that what the function does is it normalizes it to something that is a valid dog. Uh, so like note that if this was all that you did on network packets coming in, that wouldn't be very good. Um, you don't want to just way. accept everything. So what you can do, is, what we do is an item focus check, um, which is basically like it does. So all mold, all modes are item potent. They just have to be. Uh, and so they check whether if you run them, did that actually come out? If, if you run dog of Bruno, is that the same knock now as not as just the original Bruno? And if it is, then we say that it, it passed. It strikes me a bit like you can just cast arbitrary memory in like say C to like a struct and it'll yeah. try like hell to make it into a valid struct. Um, yeah, and yeah, it's that. Yeah. Okay. And actually like Hoon types are very similar structs. Okay. Like they're, they're structural in the same way. Like the, the faces, the labels there, which are the faces, like uh, they they apply to a particular index of the tree. Uh, so you, if you if you type in like you know uh, color is hairless, name is Rex, and it'll come out as like hairless Rex. Like <laughs> it won't it won't they won't swap them. So it's not exactly, like it's a little bit less associative than you might expect. Gotcha. Huh. Can calling a mold on something. Fail, or mm. will it always? You yeah, can so try. It, you try can it. force it to fail. Um, yeah, well, you, and there's there's syntax for it too. So you can do sem sem two semicolons, sem sem and then dog rex, and that'll that'll like uh, run a conversion and it'll just error out if it doesn't fit. You can also do um, hard, which will error like hard of dog rex, which will error out. Uh, and then so that the original call soft. forty two will fail. <laughs> Yeah, and you can also do a soft conversion where, like, if it fails, it just so that it, that produces a unit, which is like yeah. a maybe. Yeah, a maybe dog. Yes, yeah, so that produces a maybe dog. Uh, and if, it, if it comes out as nil, then like the cast doesn't work. So it's non-optional types, but optionally strong types. Mm. It's just that you can like it. Basically, all of it, the whole thing, just relies on type on forward type inference. Okay. And so. Um, like it, and, and these normalizing functions. So like, when you run the normalizing function, like you just, the type system just knows that like, something of the valid type is 
can come out. Gotcha. Uh, but then it can, yeah, so you can, you can error out based on whether, it's, whether that was a successful transformation. All right, so real quick in our vanishingly brief time left. So cores. Um, I could do 50 minutes just talking about cores. Um, so cores are approximately what an object is in an OO type language. Um, it's a combination of code and data. And um, there's an arm, which is a core with one function to it. No, wait. Arms are the compiled attributes. So each, each of the, each of the uh, nodes in our tree for a core is basically a compiled bit of code. And a gate is um, a core with one arm. So mint is our... So types really only matter in functions because that's kind of... I mean, we're not just... We're going to do something with our data. And we're going to do them in functions. So um, types are inferred by the compiler. You don't actually declare the types. You can do a you can do a cast, and that's kind of recommended style. Um, but it only does forward inference. It can't do backwards inference because the type system is simple, and backwards inference is kind of trickier. So, um, so yeah, I mentioned uh, casting. So in our thing. In our Fibonacci, we cast on line five, and basically this is just a way of saying, annotating to yourself that um, this is the return type we're expecting. I suppose really stylistically this should be line two, but it's the return for the internal function, which in turn becomes the value that we're gonna get. Um, so this does a few things. It kind of documents what you're trying to do. Um, if you if you're doing it wrong and you get a nest fail, you're going to get it right there in the function you're looking at rather than way off elsewhere in the app. And also, um, if you don't do a cast here, as I discovered when I was actually writing this out, you get some really weird errors elsewhere just because lists have a little bit of metadata that other parts of the, uh, the code might be expecting. So I have a really awesome demonstration of mint here that I can't do because we're out of time. Um, I'll talk about quickly polymorphism. Most of what we've been talking about has been they call it dry polymorphism which has variance which is the Liskov substitution principle. Then you can do generic um, substitution or wet polymorphism which uses um, genericity which is uh, more of the kind of the functional flavor. So in this case your code it's kind of like a macro, and it does your type inference um, based on where it's used. So um, I made a function. This is basically going to take a list and rebuild the list. So if you just have, yeah, in the version I ended up with, um, this is, it's a list of stars, basically any kind of noun, and then when you oh there we go so we make a list of unsigned decimals and it affixes these i's and t's which is part of what makes it a list so we run our rebuilder and man, me in the past needs to type faster. So then basically it rebuilds the thing. That's great. So then we have what's called a tape, which is a string as a list of characters. So if we try and rebuild, well, that's not right. So we end up with numbers there because um, looking at our, looking at the function, we basically cast all of our characters to nouns, which ends up making them look like unsigned integers. So we can make these into make these into Oh, there we go. Thank you. It's about time, me in the past. Come on, get it together. 
So we save that, and then we're going to go back to our, and then it notes that it has rebuilt it. This is some of that hot reloading stuff that is very exciting. And then we're going to set this to a value. And then through the magic of, so then there's that. And then this is kind of, I don't know if this is urban bugginess or what, but it kind of ends up with that. So, but you, if you cast it to a tape, then we get back what we're expecting. So. Right. So. Um, it would be great for a whole bunch of other stuff that I didn't have time to talk about, but um, technical difficulties and also I wasn't going to get to it anyway. Uh, but you can invite me back in LambdaCom 2019 and then I'll get into the rest of it. So here's what you can take away from, even if you never look at Urbit again, is the amazing power of simplicity, the rad ASCII pronunciation, <laughs> Kelvin versioning, and of course, um, this thing, seriously, um, spread the word on this. Um, you know, working in a conversation with like your in-laws or relatives. Um, and don't forget to call it LeBlanc's Triangle. Because um, if it takes off, you can be like hipster, but I was like, oh yeah, I was there when he like coined that term. And also, uh, oh, yeah, Urbit's cool and you should check it out. Uh, quick acknowledgements, um, that guy, Ted, Mark, and everyone at Tlon, Josh Reagan, and Worldwide Technology, my employer, were hiring in St. Louis and Denver. Um, half of those cities is really cool. And here's, <laughs> here's my contact information. Um, oh, and also if you want to get one of these t-shirts, um, urbit.threadless.com. Oh, yeah, and uh, one more thing. Nobody go anywhere. And I'm saying that to people who were, who didn't hang out here. Take one of these. Take that. Take that. Uh, what do we got? Pass that down. What? Hmm? Your let, your full. Give that guy pen. It's like a relatively unoptimized JavaScript. It's like about as fast. Okay. All right. Uh, so we're working on a, uh, a couple things using uh, one using the JVM using Graal and Truffle uh -huh. to develop uh, like a, a JIT for it, mm -hmm. and then also um, a, uh, a bytecode interpreter. Okay. So that's that's going to be wait. A one sec. You can't go yet. Okay. So this is our phenomic base. Um, SYT, so um, what's the remainder? What am I thinking of? Oh, I wrote it down here. That's good news. Uh, mod, thank you. Mod, um, any, this is give me some entropy. And then, and then when we do this, we get a random number of let. Who's let? Congratulations. You win a star. I've decided to give away one of my stars. So. Wow. Yay! Yeah.